Well, class, welcome again to our segment on biblical leadership. This time we're in lesson four. We're going to be looking at the leadership of the Apostle Paul. Looking at our lesson outline, you can see where we are here now. We're getting into the middle section of this series of classes. Yeah, the past two classes, we looked at the Old Testament. We looked at the prophet Moses and a king and King David. Now we're going to move on to the New Testament, and we're going to be starting our look in the New Testament at, with the look at Apostle Paul. One of the things we see when we look at, at Paul is that he always kept in mind that God is in control. We see through his ministry that God appoints, anoints, sanctifies, teaches, empowers, and guides his leaders to do his will. This really follows the cycle that we've talked about in the past few sessions. You know, we're biblical leaders, you know, where God will select them, he'll train them, and empower them, then he'll deploy them, and he'll guide them as he moves them, and then it just keeps moving through a cycle as God develops a leader into more and more different tasks. Take a little look at Paul's training as we see him developing into this and how he got to the point where he's you know, one of the ones that's most responsible for a good portion of the of the writings in the New Testament and considered doing one of the best evangelists and missionaries that has ever been. Okay, he was raised in a Jewish family in a Greek port city, that's the city of Tarsus. We might recall that he's often referred to as Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he was a Roman citizen, which he inherited through his father's side. I uh, don't really know exactly how his father came about having Roman citizenship, but something that served him well. Uh, Paul was a tent maker. He had a trade, and this actually came in handy as he was going on his missionary journeys, because it allowed him to uh, provide for his own support as he was in these cities, because it was something that was a, it was a trade that was transferable to no matter what location was he was in he could use it when he needed so when he got into a city where there wasn't a whole lot of support for him he could just go about his tent making business and provide the means to, in order to support the ministry while he was there uh, he was familiar with the Greek language and with Greek philosophy because Tarsus had been part of the Greek Empire it was actually brought to prominence by uh, Alexander the Great being one of the port cities of Asia. So he was familiar with the, you know, the Greek philosophy, the Greek language, and the Greek traditions. Uh, he was also a Pharisee. Now this was, at the time, you know, one of the highest positions in like the Jewish hierarchy. They were the religious leaders of the time, and they were like the implementers and the enforcers and the interpreters of the law. And as a Pharisee, he studied under Gamaliel, who was probably the foremost teacher of Jewish law at the time. And he's still actually, you know, revered today among the Jews and actually has a fairly decent <laughs> reputation among, the, uh, among Christians. Actually, we even see, uh, you know, a little bit of a demonstration of his wisdom when we look at uh, when the apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin. Gamaliel was the one that just said, hey, don't be too hard, don't be too harsh, and don't be too quick to judge. Let's just let us go and see what happens. If this movement is something that's of man, then it's going to die out, like all the others have in the, in the past. But if it is of God, then there's no way that we can stop it. That's actually, you'll see that in Acts chapter 5, verses 34 to 39, if you want to go look up, you know, the exact words that he that he says there, but quite a bit of wisdom for somebody that was, you know, a, a Pharisee at the time. And of course, Paul was very familiar with the, the scriptures, you know, what we call the, the Old Testament, or the, it's the Hebrew scriptures at the time, because his father, you know, was also a Pharisee. So even before Paul got to the point of being trained under Gamaliel, he would have had some very good training in the in the scripture and in the, the Jewish traditions of the time. So this kind of got him up to a, a certain point. Now let's take a look at Paul's transformation. 
kind of look at him, you know, maybe a little comparison here before and after his encounter with Christ on the, on the road to Damascus. You might recall that, you know, before he had this encounter, you know, being a Pharisee and a very zealous Pharisee, he was out there trying to get rid of Christianity. When you know, we first saw him, when he was holding the, the cloaks for the people that were stoning Stephen. Don't know exactly, you know, what his role was in the whole thing, but it was definitely that he had some sort of a role there. And he was on his way, you know, he was actively pursuing Christians and dragging them out and bringing them to, to trial before the Jewish authorities because according to, you know, their thought that they, you know, they were blaspheming against God. And when he had his encounter on the road to Damascus, he was on his way to Damascus because he's heard that there was a group of Christians there and he was on his way to go get them. He had a, a letter of authority from the, the chief priest that gave him permission to go yank them out and drag them back and put them in prison. So we'll look at a comparison now before, you know, between what he, he was before and after this encounter that he had. Okay, well, before he was actually a Pharisee, which was, as we said, you know, one of the highest religious leaders in the area at the time. Afterwards, he was a Christian. I mean, they didn't actually use that name at the time, but he was a follower of Christ. Before his encounter on the road to Damascus, he was a persecutor of Christians. As we just said, he was out actively hunting Christians down and throwing them into prison. And, you know, if it came to the point where they were, were convicted, then he was th throwing in the lot to say, yeah, go ahead and, and kill them. After the thing, he actually became persecuted because he was a Christian. Before, he was trying to destroy the Christian faith. Afterwards, he was one of the biggest builders of Christianity that ever has been. Before, he attacked and after, he defended. You might even add in here that before, he was doing things according to his own personal ideas and his own emotions. And after, he was doing things according to the will of God. That leads us to this principle that was in your coursework. It said that leaders learn that leadership driven by personal opinions and emotions can lead us away from godly path. When leaders are transformed by a personal relationship with Christ, then Christ will use our past circumstances to impact others. And we really see that in Paul, where all the stuff that he had been doing in the past in some way prepared him for what he was going to be doing after this encounter. Now, as I was doing this, I kind of brought up a point to ponder. You know, something to consider here. This is kind of an exercise for you to do in your own, in your own time. I uh, would have liked to have had maybe a little discussion on this, but since we're in online this week, it makes it a little difficult. Maybe we'll get a chance to uh, bring up the subject later as we're looking into some of the other topics as we move on. But consider a religious leader versus a true biblical leader. Now, the Pharisees, you know, like Paul or Saul, the names are interchangeable. Paul was his Roman name. Saul was his Hebrew name. Uh, you know, they were the top religious leaders of their day. But would they be considered biblical leaders? So I'd just like you to take some time to you know, contrast what you know about the Pharisees. You can look up, you know, see what Jesus had to say about them. And then what we know about what it means to be a biblical leader and just kind of make a a little comparison list there of, okay, this is what the Pharisees did, this is what a biblical leader is about, and just find out, you know, where there are similarities, where there are differences. I mean, just to get you started off, you know, one of the things we talk about with a biblical leader is he only does what the Word of God says. Pharisees, of course, were the ones that went and added, you know, like 600 additional laws to the original laws that were in the books, you know, that, that Moses had written down in the Pentateuch. So that's just an interesting thought, you know, to, to start off in your little comparison there. Just a little sidelight as we're as we're considering things here and continue on now looking at Paul's transformation. So Christ actually redirected Paul's zeal. 
to spread Christianity to the edges of the known world. You know, Paul had quite a bit of zeal as a Pharisee, and obviously, you know, just to read the descriptions of how eagerly he was out hunting down Christians. But Christ directed you know, that zeal towards his own purposes. So he got Paul you know, on the right track and then turned him loose on the world. And whoa, what a difference it made once Christ got Paul on the right track. He managed to, you know, prepare the heart, prepare people's hearts to receive Christ. He was caring for the new believers. He didn't just go in, preach the word, and then disappear. He followed up and made sure he left people in place to, to take care of these new believers. So they weren't just stuck there wondering, okay, I've accepted Christ, now what do I do? And as part of that, as we say, he left people in place, so he was mentoring, you know, the future leaders of these little churches that he planted. And some of them grew up to be pretty big. And, you know, he actually learned how to endure afflictions, you know, while still delivering the message. So this leads us to the, the second principle, that leaders submitting in obedience and faith to Jesus persevere in following him with energy and consistency to the end. So now let's take a look at maybe a few of the things that enabled Paul to affect history. You know, Paul had a monumental effect on history by spreading Christianity outward from Palestine to the far reaches of the Roman Empire. So what was behind this amazing effort that he, that he had here? You can actually look at two aspects of Paul's leadership. First of all, his leadership was Christ-centered and his leadership was Spirit-led. We're going to look deeper into each of these two characteristics during the rest of this lesson. Can you look at Christ-centered biblical leadership, especially as it's exemplified by Paul's ministry? Paul kept Christ at the center of his life and as part of his leadership. We always see that, you know, that he emphasizes that in pretty much every letter that he wrote, every speech that he gave. He says, you know, Christ is at the center of my life and it's the only thing that I preach. That's the second part. He said, Paul preached only the word of God, nothing added by men. Uh, that's, you'll see that I'm not actually putting all the biblical verses from your coursework into this thing here, but that's Galatians 1, 11 to 12 that you'll find in your coursework. You know, he was only preaching the word of God, nothing added by men. And that's, that's significant because as a Pharisee, of course, he was enforcing a lot of things that were added to the word of God by men. And he strived to imitate Christ and he encouraged others to do so as well. Again, you've got your coursework, you know, 1 Corinthians 4, 16. He basically said, you know, live as I do, do as I do, because I try to imitate Christ, and then by imitating me, you can also begin to imitate Christ. So Paul also advocated having the mind of Christ. Uh, the coursework, that should be Philippians, Philippians 2, 5 to 8, the verse that's in there, in your coursework. But he so this involves having humility, you know, an attitude of servanthood, and obedience to the will of God. So actually, in, I think it's about two weeks, we're going to actually spend a whole session on looking at servant leadership. And of course, Christ is the ultimate servant leader, which we'll be looking at in our next mess message, is you know, Christ as a biblical leader, obviously the ultimate one. And of course, we'll also be touching on more on the obedience to the will of God. That's part of this whole whole thing. And of course, Paul conducted his ministry to bring glory to Christ. Now this actually also is in your coursework, but I thought it was just something that needed to emphasize. It says, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Really didn't matter to Paul what happened to him as long as whatever happened brought glory to Christ. That was his whole, whole goal, that everything that he did would bring glory to Christ. Not bring glory to him, but bring glory to Christ. And that, of course, is the mark of a biblical leader, that you're more interested in people seeing Christ than they are in seeing you. you know, Paul, even though he was born a free Roman citizen, 
which was you know something very big at the time you know as a roman citizen it gave you uh, lots of advantages that you didn't have if you weren't a citizen uh, in fact well you see that as you see him going through on his various mission trips that punishment that would have happened to a non-citizen he didn't get or <laughs> the couple cases where they didn't know yet that he was a citizen and they actually administered the punishment as if he wasn't <laughs> they were afraid they were going to be in more trouble than he was so that was a big thing to be a roman citizen in those days but even though he was a citizen he became a slave for christ in order to do what god called him to do he said i'm willing to give up everything i've got here all the rights i've got and live just for christ and to do what he tells me to do and we got to do the same you know, when we lead or when we follow it doesn't really matter whether we're leading or following we're going to be doing both you know throughout our life there'll be times when god calls us to lead there'll be times when he calls us to follow no matter how high a leadership position we might eventually end up in i mean who knows some of you, you know, out there might be eventually leading you know some sort of a a big church or a big movement or a big ministry but even no matter how high you get in the leadership you're still ultimately following christ so you're always going to be both a leader and a follower and even paul occasionally got distracted by the, by the demands of leadership but by keeping his focus on Christ, he was able to endure the hardships, the demands, and the hazards of leadership. And there's lots of those, you know, you've got a certain amount of responsibility, you've got, you know, demands when you've got people depending on you. You've got, you know, hardships that are, you're going to be going through. Uh, <laughs> you've got all the people that are trying to stop you from doing what you're doing. So all these hazards are out there, and it's easy <laughs> to get to get distracted especially it's easy to get especially when you get more and more overwhelmed by what's going on it's sometimes you find out you just look at yourself if you have a moment to stop and and reflect you go i have been so focused on the details or on this or on that that really i haven't been keeping christ in my life like i should be and that's something you know when we face the obstacles the leaders we need to remember you know who we're serving and trust in him to bring us through it because sometimes, unfortunately, Christ can slip out of the center of our leadership, and that's when we need to step back and bring back and refocus and realign ourselves so that Christ is at the center of what we're doing. Otherwise, we end up trying to do it on our own, getting ourselves in trouble, possibly harming others along the way. So just a kind of a short checklist here you know of what it takes to be a christ-centered leader we got to be christ directed he's got to be the one that's calling the shots we got to be christ taught first of all we have to be willing to learn then listen as he teaches us and gives us the knowledge and experience that we need as we move on to do whatever it is he has planned for us got to be christ-led we got to follow and go where he leads us we have to try to imitate Christ to the best of our ability. That's a, whether we're leading or following, that's a task that we have from now until he calls us home. Got to be self-sacrificing. Got to put the will of God and the, the kingdom benefits ahead of our own. Got to learn how to humbly serve others. Again, we we're talking here about the concept of being a servant leader. And of course, obey God. You know, all these qualities we see in Paul as he served, the, served Christ and he led the church you know, out into the world. And he really did take it to the edges of the known world at the time. But the second aspect we're looking at here is Paul you know, not only kept Christ at the center of his ministry, but he allowed the Holy Spirit to direct him, teach him, sustain him, and encourage him. Paul basically you know, was following the Spirit's guidance once he had that conversion there on the road to Damascus that encounter with Christ himself and then the Holy from then on the Holy Spirit was directing everything that was going on he even had a you know Holy Spirit even was involved in Paul's conversion you know afterwards you know, he was led off there to Damascus where he met Ananias Ananias was told to lay hands on Paul to remove the scales and of course the Holy Spirit had to convince Ananias to get anywhere near this guy because he wait a minute isn't this Saul the guy that's been you know capturing and 
and imprisoning and killing people like me. So he had to convince him to, to do that. And then he led Paul into the synagogues to preach. And then, again, looking at the verses in your coursework, if you look at Acts 13, 2 to 4, then the Holy Spirit asked for Paul and Barnabas so that he could, the Holy Spirit could send them on a mission. So the Holy Spirit got involved right from the start, right as soon as that conversion happened. And once the Holy Spirit got involved, Paul obeyed the whole instructions that the Holy Spirit gave him. An example of this is, you know, he didn't go into Asia as he originally intended, but he went to Macedonia you know, as the Spirit told him. This was Acts 16, 6 to 10. So yeah, Paul only went where the Spirit led him. No matter what he was doing, he was going where the Spirit led. He'd get the indication he's supposed to go over to this city or that city or, gee, I really need to reconnect with this guy that I left back here, you know, in this church to check out what's going on. He only did where the Spirit led him. So we need to follow this idea and trust the Spirit to lead us to the right places and also to keep us from going into the wrong places. A lot of times maybe that's even more important to keep us going from the wrong places because we can get ourselves in all sorts of trouble if we go wandering off to places we shouldn't be. And then, you know, of course, only by having the, the Spirit dwelling in us can we lead like the Lord wants us to lead. And Paul demonstrated this for us. Uh, again, if you look in your course where Romans 8, 11, and also uh, 15, verse 16, are verses that, that bring that out. That was part of Paul's whole thing, is that he, he made room for the Spirit to indwell in him opened up his whole life to the Spirit, so that the Spirit had control and influence. And that's the same type of thing that we've got to do. Paul allowed the Holy Spirit to teach him. The Spirit guided his understanding of God's Word. Look at, you know, 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 13. That's also in your courseware. He revealed, you know, the truth of God in the Scriptures. That's the second... 2 Timothy 3.16, it talks about, you know, Scripture's good for teaching and informing and all these things. The exact wording, of course, there is in 2 Timothy 3.16. And he showed the link between knowing God's Word and actually applying it to life. And there's one thing, you know, you see a lot of people that maybe have a lot of head knowledge about God's Word, but they have zero knowledge about how to apply it. And Paul was able to do both. He had a great knowledge of the Word, but he also was great at applying it to life, his life, and then helping other people apply it in their lives. And, of course, Paul was the one to write about the fruit of the Spirit, and it's because he experienced it. So if we're Spirit-led in our ministries, you know, we also are going to experience Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are as listed in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. You know, Paul, you look through all his writings, and you'll see these, these coming out at various times. Where he was, you know, the, one of these fruits of the Spirit was maybe you know, he was loving on somebody, or he was just enjoying what he was doing. He was able to find peace even in some of the most difficult of circumstances. <laughs> Look at those sections where he's talking about you know all the times that he was beaten, you know, thrown into the, thrown into the sea, you know, left for dead. <laughs> they wanted to stone him. You know, all these things, but he was able to find peace. And all these things because he was letting the spirit control what was going on. And as we were just talking about, you know, Paul followed the leading of the Holy Spirit even when he was in danger, in prison, or under the threat of death. If the Spirit led him there, he was going to go do it. And that's something that we have to keep in mind, too, is, you know, a lot of times we're going to be asked and guided by the Spirit to go do things that really don't make a lot of sense in what we would call, you know, the normal way of life. But some of these letters, you know, that he wrote in prison, he as they call the pastoral letters to Timothy and Titus, they're still used today 
for their church instructions, for the leadership principles, and the encouragement of their church leaders. You know, Paul continued mentoring new churches and new church leaders even while he was in prison awaiting execution. He really did not allow his circumstances to interfere with his mission. All this time the Spirit was leading him, writing these things. You know, he was like actually maybe even led there because he would be he would actually have the time to write down all this stuff that otherwise might have been only done orally. You know, if he'd have been out wandering around and continuing on his trips, who knows if we would have had some of the things that were written there. But being in prison he had plenty of time to write. So he wrote all this as he went about trying to keep on encouraging the leaders that he had left in place, as we had mentioned earlier, you know, he didn't just go into a place, make a few converts, and then leave. He left a stru structure, he left a church in, in, in place so that these new believers could be fed and developed and nourished. And in order to do that, he had to build up the leaders that he had left there. Again, following what we have seen as, you know, part of what is being a, a biblical leader, and that you're always mentoring somebody else and bringing somebody else up to follow behind you so that you can keep moving on up. So initially he would go into these things. He would preach in the in the synagogues and then wherever there was a gathering of Christians. And he would be the one doing all the preaching. Then he'd find somebody there that he could mentor and bring up, you know, just like he did with Timothy and Titus. There's many of these people that you know, are mentioned that he left in charge of these little churches. And then he would keep in contact with them to make sure that they were developing so they were always at least one step ahead of the people that they were that they were working with. And then he taught these people then how to then pick up the same concepts and get people into the ministry to help them so that they weren't trying to do everything on their own too. So it was a nice continuing cycle that we had there. So if we look at a summary of Paul's leadership, you know, his Christ centered and spirit led ministry. You know, left his disciples and us with wisdom as an example of leadership that we still follow today. You know, to list just a few, we look to him, his letters for you know, how we go about doing public worship. We look for the importance of prayer, you know, the order of how to conduct church meetings, the qualifications for a church leader, and how to go about doing pastoral care. That's something, you know, that in the motel ministry, pastoral care is a big part of it. Because we got a lot of people out there that are really hurting. And we have to know how to do this. And Paul was one that was really good at pastoral care. And of course, one of our goals in doing these motel churches is that we are bringing people along from these, these churches, from these motels, so that they will eventually take over the leadership and they'll be doing the church there in the motel instead of us. So again, we're following, trying to follow exactly you know, what Paul was doing by bringing up leaders to follow us so that we can make a plant there and then continue to mentor them and then move on to the next one and keep mentoring and mentoring and growing and then encourage them to be doing the same. And part of this was just because Paul didn't compartmentalize his life. He didn't have any division between the secular and the sacred. Uh, we see a lot of people maybe doing that these days where it's like, okay, when I'm in church, I'm going to be this way, but if I'm not in church, I'm over here. This is my secular world. They're completely different, and, you know, ne'er the twain shall meet, I think. Paul didn't do that. His life reflected his ministry, and this led many to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we would really do well to imitate Paul, just like he strove to imitate Christ. And, of course, now speaking of Christ as a leader... In our next session, that's who we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at Christ as he was a leader during that short time that he was on the earth with us. And so till next time, may God bless you and have a great, great week.